This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. first speaker gets the Travel of the Year Award since he was in Atlanta as Atlanta was hit. He's a professor at the University of Minnesota, so he knows that if you get to Minneapolis, you have a greater chance of getting to San Francisco than if you're in Atlanta in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, so he huffed it out to there. Um, Dr. Parente is a professor the Min Minnesota Insurance Industry Chair of Health Finance in the Carlson School of Management and Director of the Medical Industry Leadership Institute at the University of Minnesota. He has such a long bio that I'll end by saying the, one of the reasons that we invited him is um, he's obviously an astute student of the healthcare system and in that role was an advisor to the McCain campaign um, whose proposal was um, very interesting even to those of us who um, did not vote for him, had a lot to offer. Um, our second speaker today is um, Dr. Jim Kahn, a colleague of mine from the Institute for Health Policy Studies. He also is a professor in epi and biostat statistics. Jim is a former president of the local chapter, I think, of the Physicians for Health Reform and has been a strong advocate for um, single payer, and that's the topic of his talk. But Jim's um, main area of research is cost effectiveness of interventions and in international health issues, particularly HIV interventions. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be his colleague for all these years. Um, our third speaker is Dr. Harold Luft, um, who was a longtime professor at UCSF, still is affiliated with us, former director of the Institute for Health Policy Studies and now um, the director of the Palo Alto Medical Research Institute. Hal is an esteemed student of the healthcare system, has written extensively on um, the impact of changes in the healthcare system, and himself offered a very interesting hybrid health plan, which um, perhaps he will share with you today. That too was a road not taken, and I, um, don't want to say how long I've known how because it would give away my age. So without further ado, um, Dr. Prente, thank you. Thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you, Janet. And it's a pleasure to join you from, uh, from Minnesota. Actually, uh, I, I don't feel too bad for me. I actually came from the Caribbean uh, to get to Atlanta first, uh, but it was from the Caribbean, obvious that uh, the entire East Coast was about to shut down, and uh, there were some pretty uh, limited options. Just actually managing to get myself to Minnesota the night before Atlanta died, it was really, we were on the last plane out of Atlanta that, uh, I think it was Tuesday night, uh, it took about an hour and a half negotiating at the desk, uh, just to more or less point out to Delta what their reservation system actually said. <laughs> so. I'll dive right in here in the interest of time. So I'm going to uh, give a little bit of a take on uh, one thing that I focus on at a business school, which is the healthcare marketplace and how I see it with a colorful graphic. Uh, I'll give you a, a take of uh, what I consider to be 100 years of health reform. It sort of sounds like the 100 years war. Uh, my, my brother is a scholar of uh, Renaissance history. 
and a professor also in Minnesota. And I'm going to think of, I think of health reform as a 100-year-old opera, actually, with many different voices, sometimes shrill, sometimes loud, sometimes places where you fall asleep. And uh, also, uh, then I'll transition to questions and anxieties. These are questions and anxieties I penned while one time working for the McCain campaign uh, on a plane to DC uh, and having probably one too many gin and tonics, at least I cleaned up the typos in them. And it was almost like if you've seen the movie Jerry Maguire, kind of that Jerry Maguire memo moment, like what are we really doing here type of thing. And I presented this at a, at a talk where I was allowed to use PowerPoint. Uh, business professors live by using PowerPoint. And when you actually work for a campaign, or at least with the McCain campaign, the rule was no PowerPoint, no notes, nothing left behind whatsoever. And you pretty much did you know, a stint for 45 minutes on your feet, which actually was very helpful for me as an instructor in the long run. But uh, it was liberating just to unleash that. So you'll see a piece of that. Then I'll talk about what I consider the undiscovered country, basically market-based health reform. And I'll make the argument to you that the Affordable Care Act basically is probably more of a conservative proposal. Uh, and I can even point to the roots, because besides working for McCain, I worked for, in Senator Jay Rockefeller's office in 1992 and 93, watching Bush 1's proposal come through. And if you actually look at Bush 1's proposal as legislation as introduced by Newt Gingrich uh, and others, um, it looks very similar with a few tweaks. And then talk about some projections and comments. So uh, here's a graphic from, uh, that it actually dates from my time working in, um, in Senator Rockefeller's office. It's actually from a, from a game at the time um, some of you might recognize the graphics. It looks like SimCity or SimAnt. Uh, there was actually uh, the same corporation that made those things called the Maxis Corporation has made something called SimHealth. And uh, I was enough of a health policy nerd at the time that my wife uh, bought me this game. It was in DOS 6.0, for some of you might remember. Um, and, uh, and actually, she gave it to me, very appropriately given tomorrow, on Valentine's Day. And so my love of health policy and her were so strong that, I mean, it was just like the perfect gift ever. And what was fun about this game was that it actually had a micro simulation underneath it. And all the levers we talk about now about fixing things, increasing co-insurance, increasing co-payments, changing taxes, extending credits, all were in this game that you can play. And what was also important was that there was a whole different landscape and how they all interact. So one of the most classic ones was you would say be in charge of Medicare, uh, which could be in, potentially in charge of the whole system, which is really what's happened now for, for ACA. And a decision says, here's a new medical technology. Do you cover it or not? And, you, and it, there's also additional information. So imagine Corey doing this. He says, well, it's sort of effective, but it's hugely expensive. And you say, well, I don't want to deny anyone. Yes, it's covered. The medical technology building, I think my little laser here, it doubles in size. Uh, and then c Congress and then the federal government have weeds growing up around them because of the budgetary implications of that decision. Uh, so it's a dynamic game uh, that way. And it, what it does highlight is lots of different groups. And one group that's always overlooked is big business, which actually is paying for a lot of uh, health insurance and not talked about as much through employer-sponsored coverage. And people always said, what's the courts here for medical malpractice? We found out with the Supreme Court decision on Medicaid expansion, what they're there for. Uh, but there's, it's a very complex economy. And the other thing to keep in mind is the objective of this game is to get reelected. It's not to do good works. It's, it runs in real time. And so every year, every two years, you come up to be a congressman and get reelected. So here's my, uh, in one graph, uh, 100 years of health reform opera. I actually have my undergraduate training in the history of medicine and health policy from the University of Rochester. Worked with a fabulous uh, professor there, uh, Ted Brown. Uh, who always pointed out the notion of a didactic in, uh, in history. And uh, what you really have here, and they're kind of color-coded by different movements, if you will, and different, not always the same parties, but you have lots of sort of uh, movements toward having a national health insurance system. And the important part is the starting point, the progressive era in the 19-teens, which at that point, almost every country in sort of, if you will, old Europe has a national health insurance program. Granted, not all the bells and whistles of what they have today, but they were all present. And we kind of diverted from that once we got into uh, World War I and beyond. But it's been a fight all the way up. And coverage does keep on going up. But there's lots of reasons, some very important reasons, why these things happen. But one of the things that I always harp back to my students is that a lot of the very clever maneuvers that were done in the 1940s were done by people that are largely dead and today. And so to pay homage to that, while if you're a legislative historian, that's great. If it's actually harming people in terms of policy, maybe not so great. No. That was one of my anxieties that I'm giving you a preview of coming up here. Uh, so 
We are now at sort of the end of this. Um, probably the biggest group that blocked everything was, I hate to say it in, in a medical school, but there we go. The, the American Medical Association played a huge role in blocking um, a lot of these things over a period of time. Here is just a, a preview of some of my questions um, kind of uh, coming through here. So in 2008, I asked this sort of question, why are we, do we think we're going to have comprehensive health reform when every single, most every president, even including Nixon, tried this and it didn't go? You didn't really have the piece of legislation that you needed. You only had really five times where it really fully came up as a vote in Congress. In 2008, I said, did a stakeholder take a holiday or go out of business as sort of a non sequitur? In 2010 and beyond, and now my response has changed. Basically, the medical profession, which has been the largest block of this, more or less has been neutralized by waging a civil war amongst themselves. Uh, the AMA uh, today has most of its revenue derived from the licensure of CPT4 codes for health insurance companies. Um, so they're all for expansion. It's a whole different market place than it was previously, whereas up until, say, the 1960s, 70s, most of the revenues came from dues. So my uh, home state now, um, Minnesota, the Mayo Clinic would be completely demonized uh, by the AMA because they dared to take that one dues-paying member and consolidate them into a group practice of 340 physicians in 1935 and deny them essentially 339 dues payments that they could otherwise have. Question number two, uh, and this, this is actually a question that I was very proud to put together after I got tenure. Prior to tenure, this would be a concern. And the question is, if you think about what a research university does, we have these three different activities. And since I'm a, pretty much an economist, I had to put this into a formula. So we have health policy courses on how to cover the uninsured. We have medical school courses and residencies basically focused on ultra-specialization. We have business school courses, many of which I teach, that basically make more from less public health insurance program through med technology and pharma. Because make no mistake, 75% of any medical technology today globally is financed by public tax-based insurance systems. That's to make my Medtronic future students feel happy about life, like, we're really into it for the entrepreneurship. I'm like, 75% of what you're doing is coming from somebody else's tax roll. How do you feel now? So we have that, uh, so Utility Americas, all these things, and all, X for all the things, subject to the uh, obligated money that has to be paid for the Medicare program for future generations. So my oblique answer, to be kind of cute about it, uh, was to quote my friends in the business uh, school, is that basically a, a business venture isn't called a Ponzi scheme unless it fails. It's sort of the non sequitur there, meaning that uh, if we don't really care about this until we actually have a major crisis for financing Medicare, which we're still not at yet. <laughs> And my current answer, which makes me feel a little better, is that if you really want to see a transformative breakthrough, we need all this money running through the system. If you find a cure for diabetes, an honest to God cure for diabetes uh, that's actually somewhat cost effective, 20% of healthcare costs pretty much can be eliminated if you think about the hospitalization costs and things associated with it. Most everybody would cheer except for a hospital administrator operating on a 2% margin, but it would probably be a good thing for society, and universities play a big role. And so just um, to point out the cost aspect of what's actually going on here, this is one area that um, I, I do a lot of micro simulation modeling for different health reforms. That's what got me into the McCain campaign. This is one of the areas where I have anxiety over costs, if you will, in terms of where things are going over a period of time. Some of these things have been addressed from the, uh, that have been scored by the CBO in 2010, the Class Act being a long-term care provision. But these are things that are snaking around out here that potentially are going to be put back in that potentially will blow the budget up for the, the Affordable Care Act. So the, this is essentially the, uh, the Cadillac tax potentially and health insurance tax and probably the medical device tax sneaks back in. This is the, uh, the Medicare physician fee fix, the SGR fix that people have been talking about putting back in. And then also another update that might go in to actually permanently have uh, physicians that are now to be paid at Medicare rates, if they're on Medicaid, essentially have that maintain itself throughout all of reform going out through 2019 and beyond. If you do that, you had this relatively stable part here of what the budget deficit impact was, which was basically cost neutral through 2019, blow up. And so this is sort of the creeping aspects of the cost that if you just make little changes to legislation, uh, things sort of go out of control. And one of them has already happened with the Class Act in terms of that being a pay for for the law that's now been removed. And so you have an additional half trillion or so that gets in there by 2019. Third question is, uh, and I alluded to this before, can we stop seeing dead people in our public policy? 
Uh, and so the idea is that there's two pieces that are really affecting these things. Karen Ferguson, uh, basically you can't sell insurance, any insurance, not just health insurance across state lines. It was a key provision in the McCain Act to let that actually occur. Uh, what was interesting is that as a finance professor in the business school, uh, I had a lot of my finance faculty colleagues come up to me saying, why are you proposing we, that? We, we all want that too for banking. I mean, it's not just you that wants that. So they were, they were actually jealous that we were actually putting that forward as a, as a provision. <clears throat> And the only reason why that becomes an issue is that when premiums can potentially be twice as high for adjoining states just because of idiosyncratic behaviors of the policymakers, that's kind of unfair. In the case of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, literally the premiums were 120% higher if you were separated by a quarter mile of the Delaware River. Uh, and, you're, and you're using, obviously, the exact same medical providers for the exact same health plans. It, it just didn't make a lot of sense that that would be how these things would be structured. And then the employer-based health insurance tax exemption, basically, it starts in 43, gets codified in law in the Revenue Act of 1954, and it now amounts to the largest, essentially, um, uh, sort of uh, tax exclusion that there is in the economy, bigger than the mortgage deduction. People don't talk about that. It's about $260 billion per year. Uh, it potentially creates a moral hazard risk. Most every economist thinks it's a good idea to do something about it. The Cadillac tax does something about it. The interesting thing about what we do with McCain is say, get rid of the whole thing. And so my question there is, are we willing to take 1940s medical care uh, if we're going to have 1940s policies? Probably not. Prefrontal lobotomy, actually Wall Street Journal profiled this, was sort of the go-to treatment uh, for schizophrenia in the 1940s. We've kind of moved on from that. So why are we stuck with these old policies? So anxieties, uh, basically as a health economist, found technology is great for society and a huge cost driver. Stakeholders don't necessarily come clean over what is different this time. I'm still waiting for the AMA to have this moment where we go, yeah, we know, I'm sorry. <laughs> why not? I mean, I understand corporate policy from a B-school perspective, why you wouldn't in terms of uh, others, but it would be nice to have an honest conversation. If you talk to an actuary and they matter for this, for setting premiums, basically if you want to keep your premiums down, put everybody in a high deductible health plan, you'll be at inflation. We have some recent research that shows that. If you advocate that, though, politically, you will not win uh, the sim health game. So what's the undiscovered country? Two references. One is Shakespeare, which is really where it comes from. And because most of Star Trek is loosely based on Shakespeare, if you actually read pretty much episodes 1 through you know, uh, 34 in the original series. Sorry about that nerd part there. But uh, the idea is it's the future of what lies uh, in ahead. And so what does really this mean? If you basically use the private health insurance market, well, that sounds like ACA. Uh, if you work for United Healthcare right now, you're doing somersaults, which is like, oh, wow, you're expanding Medicaid. And you're thinking, oh, well, that's good. We'll get the private insurers out of there, except that basically United services most of the Medicaid commercial market, as it were. Change insurance incentives to reduce uninsured through budget neutral and savings legislative options. We haven't done that as well. It's not clear that the ACA is not deficit uh, generating and get rid of these 1940s era policies, or at least own up to them, and then finally reward innovation and quality efficiency. That's a, it'd be great to use information better, and we don't use it as well as we should. Lots of, hopefully Hal will talk about that. I won't go into the students, because I think I have two minutes or three minutes on the board, and you've heard some of these things uh, before, but just to sort of highlight the fact that the Republicans did actually have a proposal. I'll own up to this as, a, as an advisor or someone who talks into this. That basically was the rudiments of ACA. It had a lot of the different pieces that are there, high risk pools. It had tax credits. It had reform. It had actually the origins of the uh, era stimulus, health IT components that later rolled into HIPAA and got doubled down in, in, in George W's uh, issues. There actually were expansions with HIPAA and SCHIP that kind of originate from some of the 92 uh, components that were there. Believe it or not, Ben Bernanke was the intellectual godfather for most of the tax credits and standard deduction proposals that were on the table when he was at CEA. And it, more or less, McCain took the Bernanke plan uh, with Doug, Doug Colt uh help when he worked at CEA at the time. And so now it's actually come back again as the Coburn, Ryan, Hatch, Burr version of the bill. A few last comments in the minutes remain, and uh, then to wrap up, uh, I personally I think the ACO concept is interesting, but it seems like it's uh, a repeat of other things. But what concerns me is the origins of the ACOs, which I think came from the person who thought he would be the CMS administrator uh, as the Obama administration started, which was uh, the CEO of Mayo Clinic, uh, Dennis Cortese. If, ten, if uh, Tom Daschle did not get ensnared in things, he probably would have been the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He would have probably brought along Jean Ann Lumbrew as his sort of uh, person. And she actually stayed behind to run the Office of Health Reform. And Denny would have run CMS. 
And what Denny wanted to do was ACOs because he basically was tired of a fee-for-service system. And so the diagram goes something like, insurers basically like this thing because it's just largely efficient. Providers say we hate it because it feels like we put on, us on the factory floor. And the thought is um, they want to be paid for performing. And the systems that can do that will enable that. And, but the question is then, what will the insurers do? And the insurers have actually made this known. I made this slide up three years ago. I predicted pretty much exactly what CMS would do because I worked for an insurance company before I was an academic. I, I know very much how they think about this. They're never going to give up the insurance claims data. The actuaries live and die by this information. They're going to ask for that and all the quality metrics as long as they hold the purse strings as to what's going on. And so that, that changes the dynamic. So in closing, uh, two thoughts here. If you really wanted to bring this to the 21st century, and I think with healthcare.gov, there's a lot of stuff, particularly around this area here, Silicon Valley, saying, could we just design this better? Uh, the answer is sure. And actually, there are firms in this area that could have done it a lot better. Healthcare, uh, healthinsurance.com is here, ehealthinsurance.com. And they, they could have easily have done this contract. Actually, they had pieces of it and weren't allowed to go forward with it. But you could actually use enough of the data that exists in the system today, particularly pharmacy data that's available commonly and linked for all of us across most national pharmacy chains, to basically do actuarial underwriting at a much more robust level than just age and gender, and essentially have that be uh, used for the exchanges to actually figure out what you want to have uh, be priced. And when you have a high risk, when you have someone with a chronic condition, you have that be bid up and bid out for someone to cover the difference with federal grants and subsidies and a high risk pool that's much more robust. <clears throat> and if you do better, you get rewards back as a patient or the provider gets uh, rewards back for taking care of you better. This could be done if essentially we wanted to have a more modern system that's more akin to what happens in banking and reinsurance. So uh, what are Republicans thinking about? I guess I can answer a lot of these things in Q&A. It all depends on the midterm elections, and pretty much most Republicans are looking to 2016. What's interesting is that if the Republicans take the Senate, they probably are going to try uh, to actually make some of these uh, changes occur. And the only reason I think why it might work is that if the healthcare.gov does, just doesn't work as well as people expect it to work by the midterms, there could be some thoughts that with the president's remaining two years, he might make some changes and, uh, and actually do it. So for, for example, the net new signups, you heard all the numbers that just came out saying, it's doing great. We got like another million people in January. It's, uh, it's really the net new that is the key number. We don't know net new, and we won't know net new until May or June, which is really a bad time because essentially Congress is out. You're in the midst of a midterm run up. You got a ton of negative ads all over the place. And if net new ends up being 3 million, it's going to be an ugly, ugly uh, PR battle. And so 2015, uh, there's two different paths, if the, if, as I mentioned. Uh, if essentially it's status quo, not much is going to change. Lots of people are going to make little noises, but none of that's going to really matter. Uh, and so when you really put this all together, we've had 100 years of history. Republicans actually do know a lot about this. Um, I guess the, all, the optimistic thing that I would sort of put out there is that the party of no is going to change in 2014 to 17, the leadership changing. Um, even if you look at Paul Ryan and his strategies, it's much more toward compromise and just getting something done than just saying, no, we won't do this anymore. The, the clean uh, debt ceiling vote was actually a very good thing. Um, so for better or for worse, this is probably going to be a rocky road. And normally rocky road is a good thing. It's ice cream. It's tasty. Uh, <clears throat> but this, is, uh, this will take some time, but it's not going to last very long. And hopefully, this thing will actually come around to do something uh, relatively useful. I'm kind of optimistic that enough of the foundations of the ACA will be kept by a Republican proposal if it does emerge, or if it doesn't emerge, that there will be refinements that Republicans will get to comment on again and take ownership back for what they designed in 1992. With that, I welcome your comments. Thank you. So I'm not a professor of finance. Um, I, I come from a different perspective. I, I'm, I'm a physician uh, with a, a background in um, evidence-based medicine. I'm going I'm to come back to that in a moment. And I think that, that helps frame how I think about these issues. I, I want to uh, agree with Steve on one point, uh, which is, and I think it, at least one point. Um, <laughs> I, I agree that the, the ACA uh, is not about um, a move toward a national health insurance. It's about empowering the uh, private insurance companies. Uh, it is 
arguably the biggest um, uh, shift of resources toward the poor in, in many decades, but that money to the poor is then in turn being given uh, to the private insurance companies. Um, and uh, that, uh, of course, as a single-payer advocate, that's not something that I'm, I'm terribly pleased about, and I uh, recognize as, as well as anyone uh, that the political barriers to implementing uh, single-payer uh, instead of ACA were um, quite substantial, to say the least. Uh, the efforts to implement the public option, which initially looked a little bit like expanding Medicare and eventually uh, looked like a little blip before it, it fizzled altogether was in indicative. Uh, nonetheless, um, I am a firm believer that, as Winston Churchill said, uh, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and I, I think that the ultimate path is uh, toward a single-payer approach, and I will explain why the evidence supports that. I also will point out that there is one possible mechanism within the ACA to permit that, and that is, as of 2017, the ACA allows state waivers. The rule is that if a state can demonstrate that an alternative to the exchange provides um, at least as good health care access with costs to the federal government that are no more than under uh, existing law, then the states can apply for a waiver. And some people think that that may be the basis for single-payer state options. That's a longer discussion. It is not without challenges, depending in particular on who's in the White House at that time. Uh, but it is one, one, poss one possible uh, 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 path. Here's a point toward the end of your, your comment, Steve, which I, uh, I most vehemently uh, uh, disagree, and I apologize for using your words to, to frame what I'm going to say, but I think it, it, it gets at the difference in our perspectives. You said in a mod we can move to a modern system akin to how banking and reinsurance operate, and I think that would be a terrible mistake because banking and, and reinsurance are different businesses than healthcare and different businesses than health insurance. The way I look at this issue, again, my, my training is in evidence-based medicine. What is evidence-based medicine? A show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the concept of evidence-based medicine? So um, about a third to a half of the room. Basically, several decades ago, um, the, the practice of medicine began a shift from reliance on the impressions and opinions of experts to guide clinical practice to a systematic, as much as possible, inclusive and unbiased review of all of the well-done research on uh, any number of questions in medicine, choice of, of medications to use, uh, whether or not to do certain prevention strategies, what can be expected. All of this uh, came into what we now know as systematic reviews and meta-analysis, which, again, is, was an attempt to move away from the idiosyncrasies of expert opinion into uh, a more uh, reproducible and reliable method. Um, in evidence-based medicine, we are, guide our choices, our interventions, based on a systematic assessment, meaning a careful collection of all of the evidence and an evaluation and an integration of that evidence, um, and to, to look at agreed measures of effectiveness. Well, in, in medicine, uh, the measures might be uh, mortality rates or disease rates, and in some of these reviews, also considerations of cost. So the question would be, for health insurance in countries like the United States, uh, I'm going to say we're one of the wealthy democracies. Uh, how many of you have heard of the OECD? So also about half the room or the rest of the people are just tired and not raising their arms. Um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development um, is made up of uh, European, American, and a few other countries uh, that are essentially characterized as wealthy democracies. And those countries have decades of experience with a different kind of health insurance than we have in the United States. If you look at those countries, and if you look at a, I decided not to use PowerPoint today, so if you can imagine, a, a, there's a line graph there, and there's about 25 lines that are all kind of grouped together, and there's one line that kind of veers way up to the upper right, that's the United States. And that's been the pattern of our, of our healthcare spending 
even as we have failed to ensure a substantial portion of the population. So what can we learn from the OECD experience? All of those other countries that have ensured everyone while providing uh, good outcomes and uh, while um, controlling costs much better than the United States. Uh, this evidence suggests that access to care is far better in those countries. In fact, almost all of the OECD countries have more outpatient visits and more hospital days per person per year than the United States. So they, and, and also a greater likelihood of having a regular primary care provider. Higher satisfaction with the healthcare system, with healthcare, as I mentioned, better health outcomes, lower mortality rates, and uh, other measures of, of healthcare outcomes, and better cost control. Uh, the way that has worked in those countries is a, either a tax-based financing system, so all medical care paid by money collected through taxes, or mandated private uh, financing. In the case of, the, uh, uh, of, of mandated private financing, the money has gone through not for-profit private insurers. So that's different. There are insurers in some European countries, uh, but they are by law not for profit, at least as regards to the core health care benefits that are provided. They're allowed in some cases to earn a profit on the uh, ancillary insurance, but not on the main insurance. In most, actually in about half of the OECD countries, there is a single public payer. So in Canada, at, at, that's done at the provincial level. The provincial government pays health care bills. Um, in other countries, it's done at the national level. Again, about half of the OECD relies on a single public payer and half on uh, not-for-profit private insurers. Both of those models are very different from what we have in the United States. They cover more than 99 percent of the population. This is important for both for the obvious reason that you want to get coverage to people, but also for a political reason. Everyone is in the same system. So in the United States, we keep cutting back on Medicaid. Why? Because the poor, the people who qualify for Medicaid, um, have uh, relatively little political voice. But uh, if you have a system where everyone had to use Medicaid, it would probably work a whole lot better. The United States, we're moving toward restricted physician panels, re re restricted physician choice. In uh, the OECD, other OECD countries, there's wide physician choice. And here is one of my favorite considerations, one that doesn't get a lot of attention. There are in the, all of the OECD countries, uh, with one exception, uh, there is a single, standardized, broad, benefits package. It doesn't necessarily cover everything, but it's quite broad and quite comprehensive, and it is precisely the same for everyone. Well, if I polled this room and found out what your health insurance was, there looks like there are about 50 people in the room, you'd probably find about 40 different variants of, of health insurance. That's very complex. It's complex for you as consumers making choices for with which health insurance to get. And it's also complex for providers who have to deal with many different contracts and, and arrangements. So a key piece of what we should learn from the evidence is to have a single benefits package. There's also uniform payment rules and rates. So in the United States, um, we have uh, very different payment rates uh, for different insurance plans, and in fact, Different doctors get different amounts of money. So it's extremely uh, complex to keep uh, track of and leads to some perverse incentive on the part of, of providers who get paid more to see one patient than they do to see another patient. There is a belief, uh, I call it a myth or perhaps even a meme, that if people just had skin in the game in the United States, we could control health care costs. And in fact, there is evidence that co-pays and deductibles and so on reduce health care spending, uh, particularly when people aren't very sick. But does it reduce overall health care spending? There's no evidence for that. One of the reasons is the vast majority of health care spending is from people who are 
quite sick, often in their last six months of life. And those people have long exhausted the deductibles and co-pays and cost sharing, and they're determined to get the care that, that they need. Um, and so the, the idea that skin in the game will solve the problem is, is ill-conceived. Another critical point of the OECD experience is each physician faces only one drug formulary. How many of you are physicians or otherwise deal with drug formularies? So uh, just a few of you. Um, uh, I, I think you will confirm that in, in, unless, well, if you work in the hospital, it might be different. But in, in, in private practice, uh, doctors have to deal with the formularies according to the insurer. So they have to keep track of multiple formularies. That's not efficient. Finally, what's the value of primary care providers? The evidence is that when you have a majority of doctors in primary care practice, um, that's when you both control costs and improve outcomes. The OECD countries have predominantly have that situation. Most providers are primary care doctors. In the, in the United States, it's reversed. So we have uh, about 10 lessons from the OECD countries that we are ignoring. Again, granted, there are competing political interest uh, from the AMA to the uh, conservatives to the Heritage Foundation, which proposed the ACA. And then when it came around, I mean, didn't call it the ACA, but when it came around, opposed it. Um, with apologies, I'm an evidence-based medicine guy. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a political operative. I have some friends who are political operatives uh, working for single payer. Um, but I think that what we want to keep in mind, what we want to head to ultimately, is, um, it is, is the evidence-based approach, which is a single-payer approach. And I will, I will end with uh, a quote or a summary of a quote from, from President Obama. He, wrote, he said, I happen to be a proponent of single-payer universal health care. But then he goes on to explain that we have a system that we just have inherited and we should stick with that system. In other words, he's a believer in path dependence. We're here because of how we got here. We can't change our path. And in that point, I respectfully disagree and hope I can prove him wrong. Thank you. I'd like to take a quick poll. Um, how many of you people are more persuaded by Steve Parenti's proposal and by Jim Kahn's? OK, I'm in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> so, so I actually think that they are both on the mark with different items. Steve's presentation, from my perspective, was largely political uh, in recounting the history of how we got to where we are. I would take you back to his little Sim Medicine uh, slide, which I think is a wonderful one. And if you think through some of the background information, some of the stuff behind that, you would realize that that picture is Washington, D.C and not any capital in Europe. And that goes back, n n not to the bizarre architecture and things of that sort, it goes back to the fact that the American Constitution is fundamentally different from the way parliamentary systems work. It's structured, it was structured by the founding fathers, yes, they were all men, to make it very difficult to make change. They had just been through a revolution. They did not like the idea of a central government. Those people who did like central government, the Tories, went north. That's why Canada has a good health care system. <laughs> we instead got a constitution that uh, gives a lot of power to the states, very limited power to the federal government. It has a Congress and an executive branch that are not unitary, unlike a parliamentary system. And the history of the Congress gives enormous power to congressional committees. The famous Clinton proposal never came to a vote in the Senate because it couldn't get out of committee. So that's the big level politics. Let me go to a smaller level politics and evidence-based medicine. 
Just yesterday, very clear study out of Canada suggesting that routine mammography for screening does not save lives. How many people are willing to bet that a single payer system in the United States would be able to implement a recommendation of let's not screen for breast cancer using mammograms? I mean, it actually came up in the past. You know, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force suggested we didn't need to do it as often. The blowback from that was huge. Minor technical issue. This is not passing health reform. This is the power of the experts who will bring their evidence base. The radiologists have a different evidence base than other people. Um, and yet, how is a government in the United States that is not willing to empower a federal agency to make even trivial decisions going to make the kind of evidence-based arguments that Jim Conn is suggesting. I think it needs to happen. So I think the changes that we need are crucial. Fundamentally, what I'm focusing on is not how we get everybody covered. I think absolutely we need to do that. Uh, I am tired of pretending I'm a Canadian when I go abroad because I'm embarrassed about the number of people who don't have health insurance in the U.S. And even if the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented, you know, there are these folks who mow the lawns and clean the houses and aren't here legally, and they are explicitly excluded. Okay, this is embarrassing. What I'm focusing on is how do we change the rate of growth in health care expenditures? That's what we need to have a sustainable health care system. That's where we need evidence-based medicine. The problem, and, and Jim's right, look at the OECD countries. They've got roughly 50 percent of their physicians being primary care doctors, small number of specialists. They do almost all of their work in the hospital, so you've got controls over capital. That's actually the solution. We should take all of our specialists and send them to underserved countries <laughs> and get to that 50 percent ratio. Um, I don't think we're going to get there magically. So I'm not looking for the after the flood solution. The after the flood is we get rid of all the specialists. No, you first want to get rid of all the lawyers. Uh, but then you get rid of the specialists, and then you have the right balance of physicians. And we change the way medical schools are training medical students to be specialists, et cetera. I know UCSF is better than average. We need to think about how we actually change that ship's motion, the ship of the healthcare system, in place when, in fact, there is no way that a captain can just turn the steering wheel. So the way to do it is evidence-based medicine. I absolutely agree. But we can't even get physicians to read evidence-based reports. And there's only a tiny fraction of medicine that has an evidence-based base, basis to it. And there's enormous variability in practice in a delivery system even when the evidence base is out there. You need to get the clinicians together to actually agree on changing what they do. This is hard. It's hard because of the way physicians are trained to be, feel responsible. It's hard because often the right thing to do is not doing something, and you worry about having made that mistake. So the system, the delivery system, down in the grass needs to change. So I actually think, Steve was making fun of the ACOs. The, the, that's the accountable care organizations. I think that is one of the two really key things in the Affordable Care Act. It's deep in the weeds. Only a few people understand how they work. And that's sort of fine. Because if we really made a big deal of it, it would have been killed. And so the accountable care organizations are, is a way in which Medicare can talk to a collection of physicians. They don't have to be a group practice. And if they sign a contract through some entity with Medicare, the expenditures on their population grows more slowly than Medicare was predicting, and they have high quality, they get to share the savings. That's the rough version. There are lots of little details. Interestingly, a whole bunch of organizations 
are signing analogous kinds of agreements with all those bad insurers, saying if we lower the rate of growth and expenditures for your insured population, we, the providers, get to keep the savings. Now, how are the providers going to do that? They do it by changing their practice. They now have an incentive to do that. Outside of the Affordable Care Act, high tech, putting all those EHRs on doctor's desks, they're actually getting used, at least some of them, to understand what the practices are for the physicians to actually put on their thinking hats and say, can I generate some evidence from my own practice and the practice of my colleagues and figure out how to do this differently? And you know, if we can avoid one MRI, we, the accountable care organization, can shift those dollars around, hire nurses, pay the primary care docs better, shift our mix of providers. Narrow networks, narrow networks are not very nice when they're done by an insurer. A narrow network, <clears throat> when the primary care docs get together and say, you know, I don't think we need to include all the orthopedists in town because we're the ones who are going to refer to the ones who only do surgery when they need to, needs to happen, not having a back as an indication for doing a procedure. And so that is part of the way that moving to Africa becomes attractive for some orthopedists. <laughs> not through federal regulation, not through a single payer system, not through an insurer excluding, but through the clinicians getting together and changing things. The second key thing in the Affordable Care Act is the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, partially funded federally, but really it's funded by a little tax on all those insurance policies. And the nice part about PCORI is that it's not a federal agency, and it is charged with producing exactly the kinds of studies, not the decisions that come out of NICE in Britain, but the studies that allow independent organizations to say, you know what? Maybe we're not going to cover mammograms on a routine screening basis unless you have some high risk factors, et cetera. And that's OK, because we're not federal. So PCORI is generating the kind of evidence that you would want to have, but you could never get out of a, quote, single payer system in the United States because of the way our political structure works. There's a lot more. If you really got into it, you, there, there are antitrust issues, there are data use issues, there are things of that sort. But those are the kinds of things that I think we really need to be thinking through in terms of what kinds of modifications might be necessary in the Affordable Care Act, maybe a few around the edges. Um, you know, it, 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 from my perspective, it's really all politics. We're beginning to see a slowing in the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures, unlike anything we've really seen in the past. Some economists feel that, oh, it's just the economy growing slower, there's a lag effect, et cetera. I think there's actually changes on the ground. Now, five and a half years ago, I left UCSF, now heading a research shop inside a delivery system. They are making changes. They are making changes in advance of where the pressures are. They are walking away from reimbursements they could get because they're saying things need to be done differently. So that's saying to me, and I think there are other organizations doing the same thing. I think the real key will be when we start seeing pharma and the device companies changing what they're investing in, focusing on innovations that lower cost rather than increase cost with maybe a small increment in quality. I think we're beginning to see a little bit of that. It's too early to tell that part. But those are the kinds of changes that I think are fundamentally going to be needed to get that slowing in the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures, because that's what we need for sustainability. Thank you. So we're going to shift from academic mode to Oprah mode here. <laughs> And um, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative by asking basically the same question to each of the three panelists. 
And then after they get a chance to answer that question, we'll take the mic out into the audience, not literally. I'll repeat your questions, or Janet will, and um, we'll take it from there. Um, but first of all, I want to thank the panelists for a um, really thought-provoking session. And I think rather than go in the order in which they spoke, I'll start with uh, the same question, but this time start with Jim Kahn. Um, as you pointed out, Jim, the reason we got the ACA was what was possible given the kind of political system that Hal and Steve described in the, Steve in the history, Hal and sort of the political science lesson. Given that the ACA exists, what is the one tweak, if you had one tweak to do, that you would do to get it closer to the principles that you were espousing? Um, change it to single pair. They can't hear you. They can't hear you, Ed. You don't have the microphone. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> obviously, a, a, a difficult choice. Uh, uh, one possibility uh, would be just uh, simply to insure everyone, but I won't pick that. I think if I had to choose one uh, tweak that would uh, uh, move it a little closer to single payer, I would say to have a single, absolutely 100% uniform benefit package. That everyone is insured in precisely the same way. So uh, I, I think it should be a single payer system too, but a private health insurance system. So no, I'm sorry, uh, I'd expect that somewhere. So uh, if I had one tweak, I would probably take the Cadillac tax and turn it into a Chevrolet tax. Uh, again, getting uh, this ex this amount of money that's out there that's essentially uh, a tax break for a, a large, a very regressive tax break actually um, for folks is. Uh, leaves a lot of money on the table. It potentially causes uh, overutilization of health services because of generosity in the employer-based system. And if you did that, you would actually not have the ACA be largely on a track of being deficit financed. So that would be my one change. So, so since I um, had one little con contested comment, uh, Jim, I'll have one for you as well. And. Um, I'm a little surprised given the political system and what we hear in Congress 43 or more times that it isn't the mandate to get coverage that you mentioned. Um, I, I, this, I guess not, the mandate was something that a few people at Heritage and Mark Pauley talked about doing before. Um, I think that the price mechanism for health insurance uh, solves that. Uh, and some of the things that were talked about in the McCain plan that are actually in the ACA, high risk pools, if done properly, would solve that as well. So that you can get the exact same level, if not more people covered, without having an individual mandate. Um, my concern about the ACA's individual mandate is that it's puny. Uh, it's not very binding. Uh, and it also, uh, I think, most people still don't understand if you actually, from polling data, understand what the ACA is even about. They think it was national health insurance. A lot of people think it was single payer. And once they realize that they're about to be taxed, uh, because that's what's going to happen through the individual mandate system, this whole thing might be trash. Before I pass on to Hal, I'll just comment that I guess if Obama had known how much vitriol there would be in opposition, he would have just done a single payer, because they call it socialist just the same, so you might as well have done that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into minor tweaks um, and, uh, along the lines. Um, I'd actually focus a little more on some clarity on antitrust and pricing issues, uh, partly because there's enormous consolidation occurring now among hospitals, among provider groups, et cetera, uh, that I think can be dealt with if we actually had a uniform pricing structure, wh wh which is different than uniform benefits and all that other stuff. 
Um, and in the absence of that, those organizations are not making the kinds of moves to become more efficient because they, uh, there's just the an enormous legal uncertainty around it. So it's trying to unfreeze some of that stuff that's uh, that is there because of the legal uncertainties around antitrust and other issues. So with that, um, we entertain questions from the audience um, and who's going so I'm going to repeat the question for the um, audiovisuals, and it's um, what if we mandated that Medicare level administrative overhead and profit, just to use your terms, um, of 3% rather than the, I believe it's 15% that's permitted generally in the ACA. Who's going to take a stab at that? Good idea. Um, I, I think the the, uh, the evidence, if you if you count insurance company profits as well as their administrative activities, as well as the uh, effort put by providers into dealing with billing and insurance, if you add all of that up and look and compare it to a similar kind of analysis from a simpler s system such as Canada, you end up with an estimate of about. $350 billion per year in avoidable billing and insurance related administrative costs. That's a one time savings, but it does reset the bar much lower and provides you either save that money or you use it to cover the remaining uninsured. Um, Hal, did you want to take a stab at that as well? So, so part of the issue that, that I have, and I actually have a whole plan um, which came out in 2008, but then other things happened. Um, uh, the book was probably in 2008, but uh, things changed in Washington. Uh, I think if we separate some of the functions that insurers do, bearing risk, it's sort of silly to have them bear risk. Uh, you ought to have universal coverage. That's different than a single payer. Um, Medicare actually relies on insurers to process the paper and they're reasonably good at doing that. You get rid of the marketing, a lot of that will go away within exchanges. You move to a standardized benefit package, not necessarily one, because if it's one, we can be pretty sure that in, in the United States, this will not cover abortion. It may not cover contraceptives. So think about what you wish for if you have a universally determined benefit package set by the Congress. The parts that I would have the insurers do is become information providers to the clinicians. If you think about that, so they can understand what kinds of services other people are using, what their outcomes are, an information processing kind of effort becomes a very reasonable thing. And I actually had one insur I had multiple insurers, but a doctor would choose only one to work to carry all the claims that the doctor sees. So that's a very different model. You can turn it around and you can play with the same kind of capabilities very differently. So uh, CMS or Medicare, that 3% has roughly, even now at the Affordable Care Act in additions, uh, about 3,700 staff, maybe up to 3,800 staff. The claims processing component of the carriers for the Medicare program constitutes now 100,010, 110,000 FTE equivalents. Those firms that service them are firms called Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, I uh, believe IBM. None of them are nonprofits. The margins they make on it are rather substantial. I submit to you that the accounting that's used needs to be fully accounted by the for-profit entities that actually handle the data beyond the brave 3,500 souls at CMS. What's the evidence that if Republicans recontrol the Senate and perhaps the presidency that they will um, maintain some aspects of the Affordable Care Act as it was passed? Uh, mostly because it's their 
legislation at the heart of it. The tax credits, uh, even the ex Medicaid expansion, if you go back to the 92 legislation, was supposed to go through community health centers directed by states, uh, not quite to the same level as the expansion. Uh, reinsurance pools, um, there's limited tort reform, health IT, that's all in there. That said, if the Senate switches in 2014, it means nothing um, because the President has veto power and there's almost no way uh, short of calamity, which won't happen uh, likely, that, um, that that would happen. Come 2016, uh, really cutting into 2017, um, I've seen the proposals that are out there from uh, a whole variety of different groups. No one's talking about scorched earth. Uh, most everything that's repeal and replace is effectively uh, repeal for about uh, 15 seconds while the vote is taken and maintain about 70 to 80 percent of the ACA, which again has some origins in market-based health reform designs. Uh, probably the biggest thing that would be changed is that the tax credits would become less generous and there would be more uh, balanced budget components as to financing the credits that remain. That's the leading bill that's out there by Senators Hatch, Coburn, and Burr. Um, and even that has created uh, internal strife within the Re Rep Republican Party, but it's actually, uh, they're debating it and they're not just turning it off. And that's actually a welcome change. Uh, that type of bill in 2010 would have been squelched from discussion by the Republicans. So if there's been a good thing from the Tea Party, it's that the Tea Party going too far in the sense of shutting down government in 2012 has led to, or 2013, has led to a more adult conversation among some of the party leaders. I know from here, from this perspective, it may not seem that that's the case, but it, to my mind, there's been a little bit of a sea change over the last few years, and the evidence being a clean bill for the debt ceiling, that wouldn't have happened a year ago, and didn't. Just to pick up on that, my concern um, is that the repeal and replace would eliminate PCORI and probably eliminate accountable care organizations because those are the two things that really threaten the existing interest groups. And then all the other stuff, you know, they'll play with the device taxes and the, you know, that's all political theater. And so that's my real concern that it might be 80% replaced, but the 20% that gets dropped are the things in the weeds that are really beginning to hurt. And the problem is that those things have not yet had enough clear impact that the Congressional Budget Office would show the cost of eliminating them by repeal and partial replacement. I think there was a question. I'll repeat the question and then make a snide comment. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great question. The question was, is there anything in the ACA which deals with, well, <laughs> she made the snide comment herself. <laughs> the question was, uh, for the audience outside this room, um, is there anything in the ACA that deals with the fact that an awful lot of healthcare costs occur in the last six months of life? And of course, the snide comment is, you mean death panels. So with that as, um, I'm going to pass the mic as quickly as I can so I don't have to take a stab. <laughs> so, so I would actually argue that there is. PCORI, the patient-centered outcome. PCORI, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And PCORI is charged with, well, actually they expanded their charge, but they are looking at patient-centered outcomes. And so the simple example here would be move beyond mortality rate and look at what it is that patients and their families really care about. Quality of life, uh, self-realization, things of that sort. Measure those things as well. It, if you want to do re research and get funded by PCORI, you actually need to include patients in your research, not as subjects, but in asking the questions. So as those questions get asked, a lot of people say, you know, another six months feeling pretty miserable is not exactly the treatment I want. So the, the question was, in the debate over the uh, Affordable Care Act, there was discussions about funding experiments 
to see how one could lower with the rate of growth and cost. And there is, I think, $10 billion in the Innovation Center within uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And th those demonstration projects, those experiments are ongoing. There's some debate over are they randomized controlled trials versus demonstration projects, things of that sort. Uh, but yes, those things are happening right now. And, and just a comment, uh, I mean, th there are Republicans, my, myself included, that are actually fans of PCORI. And granted, I'm a researcher too. Uh, fans of the Innovation Center. Um, the, uh, the Innovation Center um, actually has something that's very important, which is nor normally Medicare could only have research and demonstrations, and the demonstration can't go forward to actually be applied to all of Medicare uh, unless it goes in front of Congress, which could kill it, and always has, uh, except for a few things, um, say the Medicare Advantage uh, program. What uh, happened in ACA is that there are now pilots that are allowed, and so pilots actually can go forward without necessarily the full vote of Congress, and that could allow innovation to happen in the market uh, much better. So um, I, I'm going to, um, I guess, make one comment. I, I never met Sarah Palin, so I don't know anything about the definition. I had no bearing at all when I put that disclosure out there. She was not my choice. But I do want to say that one thing that I think Republicans are, have been somewhat in favor of, I'm personally in favor of, is the, the better use of health information technology to measure the outcomes and things that need to be in the Innovation Center, that need to be in PCORI. And what concerns me is that uh, there still hasn't been enough work done to let the data be collected and amassed and used in a way that truly would look at a patient-centered approach. That is, uh, with all the investment we put in health IT, it's still largely in the hospital's hands about whether the data will actually be able to put together in a unified record. Uh, other countries don't do that as much. Um, I am very uh, suspicious of most providers about this, about not willing to combine their data because of malpractice risks, other concerns. Uh, I am the governing chair for a health insurance database of 50 million covered lives. The negotiations that we had to go through to get the insurers to get to that point uh, is pretty substantial and, and kind of depressing that uh, something so obvious to look at how to improve and reduce costs and everything else like that, when all the data is clearly available, we can't get past uh, intellectual property rights and basically monopolistic tendencies to advance the system. Um, the question is, um, actually there was an interesting preface, which is the person who asked the question was part of an effort almost four decades ago to um, institute health planning agencies around the country. And many of us regret that that did not go forward to a greater degree. The he could talk a day on that subject, and maybe we'll invite you back to give him a mini med next year. The question was, what can we learn from the Massachusetts experience, and what could we potentially learn from what may be going on in Vermont? I might, I might take a stab at this. Uh, first of all, to your health systems agency question, my first internship in the U.S. was at a health systems agency in upstate New York. And actually, Rochester's model was one of the national models for that in the late 1960s with Marion Folsom, the second ever health education and health education welfare secretary. Um, and just to the single payer point, just to connect the dots here, I went to do that job because I worked at the British National Health Service as an intern the year before and was looking for something close to that level of systems thinking that could be applied in the U.S. It's a longer journey over wine. I can explain to go how I got to here I am today, but. Uh, I do, one comment I'll make about that is that uh, it, it's, it's a great approach, but the data has to be there and has to be buy-in, and, and a lot of those interests that were on the board for that graphic is what sort of shuts that stuff down. Um, in the case of Massachusetts, what Massachusetts told us is that you don't have to subsidize people to 400 percent of federal poverty to have an impact. It, we actually, that's what the Republicans have put on the table. If we actually stuck to that playbook, the law would be a lot cheaper and potentially less wasteful. Um, it also demonstrated that you didn't have to have a very expensive individual mandate. John Gruber, an economist, uh, had a big role in that to really have it be somewhat effective. And it, um, 
As far as Vermont's concerned, I think Vermont is too much of an outlier, not just because of it's the least dense state in the country, it's that it only has to worry about Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont to persuade uh, in a single payer system. Uh, my first job was working for Blue Cross Blue Shield, W-2 job, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Rochester, New York, which the running joke was it was the single closest thing you're going to come to Canada, both physically and also politically, of a single payer system because 85% of the market was in that Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. That's one reason why the health systems agency was so effective was because uh, there was actually much more close coordination between the financing mechanism and the planning authority. Uh, so I've seen these things work very well. The problem is you have to get them to the anomalies beyond one or two states. And that was always a frustration to me, being a real fan of Rochester, that when I got to D.C., no one cared. Uh, maybe there was one day Senator Moynihan cared about Rochester because it was in the news and then was forgotten literally the next day because there was no way to replicate Rochester's experience with corporate entities and corporate communal uh, activism to a national scale. At least the thought you couldn't do it. So uh, for Massachusetts, I, I think some of the press for Massachusetts says great success, you know, almost everyone covered. Massachusetts started with very high coverage, and depending on which polling you use and which measures of insurance, they basically covered about half of the uninsured. So they've half solved the problem. Um, similar to what would happen with ACA if it were fully implemented. Um, they did not control costs. They still have substantial access problems. So I think it's probably a reasonable estimate of what would happen with the ACA after full implementation, which in my view is not enough. Um, Vermont uh, does have legislation that it is supposed to foster a move towards single payer. There is, seems to be uh, some cold feet about t how far to take that, whether it would really be single payer. In, in the single payer movement, it's, if it succeeds, it will be seen as a state going to single payer. Is that more powerful than Rochester going to single payer? Uh, Rochester having a, a grand experiment? I don't know. It's a whole state. It's officially saying, uh, you know, identified as a state. Uh, it never occurred to me that, that it would be dismissed as an outlier situation, but we'll wait and see. So, so the question is, regardless of what is or isn't happening in Washington, uh, what can be done to foster patient partnerships between patients and providers uh, to provide the best care possible? And then a second part of that about uh, getting specialists perhaps to give up some of their funds in order to make the system happen. And, and I'm going to suggest that any specialist, you know, that's a little bit of a <laughs> red flag in a quaternary tertiary care medical center, but let's take it anyway. So par part of the way I look at this in terms of the specialists in the hospitals is we're not necessarily asking each specialist to give a part of his or her income but rather collectively there may, will be less money spent on certain kinds of specialty care because there will be fewer specialists doing it. And so the way I view it is most care starts with a primary care doctor. That's where the patient enters the system. There are probably some patients who really love their rheumatologist because it's an ongoing problem. Probably not very many who love their orthopedic surgeons because they don't keep going back to them. If they do, they probably have a problem. And so what you would like to do is have a model where the primary care physician is able to spend more time understanding what the patient really wants. Maybe have a medical orthopedist do an assessment. Is it surgery going to be worth it for this patient? Is it going to solve the problem? Is it not? Have we tried other things first? Who has no interest in doing the surgery, just has an interest in making sure the patient's wishes are well understood. And then you find the surgeon who is really good and is kept very busy doing procedures that need to be done, but on a smaller number of people. So that's the kind of model. Interestingly, some hospitals are actually working hard, being pressed by Medicare to reduce their readmission rates. That doesn't make any economic sense for hospitals collectively, but an individual hospital may say, 
Well, if we can figure out how to keep our patients happy, we will attract patients from our neighboring hospitals, the competitors. Some of them will close, and each one is hoping to be the survivor. So the question is, um, the gentleman points out that often two hospitals, one will have a very high cost structure with many more procedures of a certain kind and another will have a much lower and um, I think part of the question, embed in the question was the comment that usually the higher costs are often associated with whether or not it's a for-profit institution. So um, anybody want to take a stab at why there's variation either hospital by hospital and common procedures or by implication and by regions because we've seen And he tends to do more by region, but. So, so, so I think there are a couple of things potentially going on here. Because going back and looking at Jack Weinberg's work, he was mostly looking at not-for-profit hospitals with Medicare data, so the payment was all the same, and there's enormous variability hospital to hospital to hospital. And his early insight was that the lack of an evidence base lead f led physicians, surgeons initially, to practice in a certain way. And they had no reason to change whatever they were doing. And so it wasn't that one hospital was had a high surgery rate for everybody. It's that in one town, in Vermont actually, where he started it, the likelihood of surviving to the age 80 and still having your gallbladder was very small but the likelihood of surviving to age 80 and not having a hernia was very high. And in the next town, it was reversed, and merely because the general surgeons had a different way of doing things. Now, if I were a for-profit hospital, I would try to attract into my medical, because hospitals don't do procedures, surgeons do. Hospitals don't order MRIs, physicians do. I would attract to my medical staff the docs who like to do a lot of those things. <laughs> um, there are no individual physicians I know who are not for profit. I mean, they may give a lot of charity, but they are all for profit under the IRS code. Um, hospitals may choose their medical staffs and seed them with the physicians who will feed their business model. Of course, our hospital is completely altruistic <laughs> here at UCSF. <laughs> yes. Our rheumatologist is now going to ask a question. So Dr. Gross asked the question, and we have the world's expert in answering that question because for about 15 years of his career, Dr. Love spent doing the most systematic analysis of organized systems of care, which we've now come to call managed care, and um, particularly the prepaid group practice form and Kaiser Group Health. So without further ado. <laughs> So l l let me try to m move this discussion a little bit because what I'm trying to do is get down to the level of the individual physician making a decision. A within Kaiser, there's an incentive for the organization not to do things that are excess, and they can have guidelines and things of that sort. But it also means that they can try to deal with the physician's uncertainty and need for information. So one of the things they've implemented in a, a lot of their facilities is the in-house on-call expert. So for example, you may have one urologist available anytime during the day at his or her desk being the consultant to any primary care doctor in the medical center. So a patient comes in, sees the primary care doc, 
unclear problem, probably needs a urology consult, maybe, maybe not. You pick up the phone, somebody who's busy doing paperwork otherwise answers, said, no, not a problem, doesn't send, or yeah, I really would like to see this patient, but order this test first, send them up to me, et cetera. Now within Kaiser, because they are paid on a salary basis, they don't have to worry about whether that's a billable procedure or a consult. One can change that even in a fee-for-service system. Typically, that phone call or an email consult, you can attach an internal payment for it. We c in within UCSF, that could be done. In fact, it's actually beginning to be done. Uh, and so that's a way of altering the incentives and avoiding a lot of unnecessary tests being ordered, a lot of wasted patient time going to see a urologist who really didn't need to see the patient, who could have just asked the, you know, the in primary care doctor about the symptoms, given some reassurance that if it doesn't get better in two days, have him see me, et cetera. And that's the kind of thing that recognizes what's going on. And I think an important part of it is you've got Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, which sort of acts like an insurer, and the Permanente Medical Group. And they negotiate with each other. And so I think the physicians came up with how can we lower cost? We need to deal with our need for information, uncertainty, et cetera, and you build a model of that sort. And so, again, that's the kind of thing you can see an accountable care organization working out within itself in a way that would be really hard for Medicare to decide how much is that consult worth. I, you'll each, if you'd like, respond to this, and then we're sort of at our limit, but Dr. Pronte. Uh, very, uh, very quickly, I think the um, Kaiser has been trying to break out and has made inroads in a few other states outside of essentially the West Coast, uh, not to necessarily great success. Um, an area of research I've been doing a lot of work in is consumer-driven health plans, high deductible health plans. Pretty much it's just a reinvention of indemnity insurance from, say, the prior to the 1970s come back into form with some consumer-driven internet pieces that are bolted onto it. Um, that's now eclipsed uh, managed care in its historic form in terms of what's being offered in employers, mostly because of premium pricing. And so it's, it's, it's a complex stew of things in terms of when you look at the consumer's behavior and what do they want. And to be honest, it didn't help in the 1990s for the American medical profession to basically demonize HMOs and have movies like As Good As It Gets sort of say, manage care or hell and have it be on Newsweek's cover. That didn't help anybody. And it might have slowed the, actually stopped in its tracks the, the last time we saw a major decrease in year-over-year -year expenditures for very legitimate reasons as opposed to a recession or a high deductible health plan surge. Uh, just one uh, quick comment, and that is in a single-payer system, you, you can pay doctors fee-for-service, you can capitate medical groups, and these kinds of important innovations uh, also can happen uh, and, and hopefully would. So I, I think by Dr. Gross's question about the Kaiser system, I happen to know that he wouldn't mind if um, he and the doctors on his medical staff were paid for consults more often and better when they are. And with that as um, the final question, I thank the audience and I thank the panel and especially thank Dr. Parente for Herculean efforts to get here despite the storm. Thank you.